Hello, I'm Dick Gooding, and I'm your host for today's edition of Veterans Remember. Veterans Remember is a series of conversations and interviews that I've been able, been fortunate enough to participate in uh, with our veterans from Hopkinton and uh, from all around. Uh, we are delighted to have this opportunity to share a little bit of history, uh, military history that's tied into Hopkinton and some of the stories we hear are just fascinating as can be. And uh, I look forward to uh, uh, spending a few hours with you over the next number of months. And uh, tonight we have a special guest with us, and this is Lieutenant uh, Colonel Dan Pincava of the United States Air Force. Dan Pincava enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1985. He was selected for Warrant Officer Flight Candidate Training at Fort Rucker, Alabama in 1987, where he learned to fly Army helicopters. Warrant Officer Pincava earned his Bachelor of Science in Professional Aeronautics from Embry-Riddle University in 1992. Dan then received his commission as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army as a graduate of Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia in 1993. In 1995, First Lieutenant Pincava transferred to the U.S. Air Force, where he continued his service to the United States as a helicopter pilot. Lieutenant Colonel Pincava has held a wide range of operations, training, and acquisition positions in joint service operations. He has trained on all combat helicopter equipment and has had multiple deployments in all U.S. combat operations since 1991. Lieutenant Colonel Pincava is currently assigned as flight commander with the 90, 950th Electronic Systems Group at Hanscom Air Force Base. Please join me in welcoming Lieutenant Colonel Dan Pincava to Veterans Remember. Dan, welcome aboard. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I think it's uh, important to uh, have an opportunity as we're all getting older, uh, it's nice for our, our, our youth to understand uh, the town's uh, participation, uh, not only in the conflicts, but the aftermath of conflicts and, and what uh, they've contributed to the strength of our nation. Uh, I look forward to hopefully discussing uh, freely and openly uh, as much as I can. Sure. Well, we appreciate that. and. Uh I, I think it would be uh, uh, really important for us to sort of get an understanding of your uh, chronology of events or general history of your military service. Uh, it's unusual for somebody to work both in the Army and then in the Air Force, and uh, I think it would be fascinating. Uh, I gave a quick snippet of, a, of an overview. Uh, it might be uh, interesting to try to understand a little bit behind uh, your decisions at, at that point in your life. Yes, uh, if anybody looked at my career path, they would think, uh, wow, uh, you're in a mixing bowl and you're just spinning around. However, what really brings me to Hopkinton is that um, uh, my mother-in-law, uh, Betty Wyckoff, lives in town. She's been a Hopkinton uh, for 30, 40 years. Yeah, uh, Betty graduated high school with my wife, so uh, 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 I know Betty very well. and and uh, uh, she certainly has uh, added a lot to our community over the years. Well, um, I, I married Betty's uh, oldest uh, daughter, Gretchen, and um, uh, our, our stint in, in Florida at the uh, uh, Air Force Special Operations Command uh, was coming to an end, and uh, for family reasons, we have moved up north to help and uh, uh, take a new job, a new career path. It's kind of ironic uh, that we're here because you start out as one thing in the Army and then you end up entirely on the opposite uh, spectrum in the Air Force. But uh, Dick, getting back to what you first started uh, to allude to, yeah, my career path is uh, uh, one that is uh, very different from the norm. Uh, I, I came to America uh, in 1973. I was 13 years old, and during that time period, you well know, the turmoil, uh, the revolution, if you will, that was ongoing in America. Uh, coming to America with a buzz cut and looking at the rest of America and, and what I thought was a uh, uh, state of disrepair, 
it was a very um, difficult uh, transition. Uh, what, brought, what brought you to America to begin with? Well, um, my father and my uh, my father worked for the government as a contractor, and my mother worked for the State Department uh, at the embassy, and they met overseas in, in Southeast Asia. I've got four older brothers who were born in Taipei, and I was born in Japan. And then we uh, came back to America when my father's uh, uh, employment was up, uh, decided to retire. So we came to uh, the East Coast, Massachusetts. Well, we certainly are glad that you made that that decision, or, or your parents made that decision. I guess you were probably a little young to make it yourself. But, uh, so why don't you uh, explain uh, your involvement in, in military service and what, uh, oh, sure. what that was all about? Um, like any, any young person, you know, in, in my time, I came to America where it was um, uh, transition. It was many different things were transitioning. People were transitioning. Our philosophies were transitioning. Uh, many different things were in, I, I, I call it turmoil because it wasn't uh, easy, it was up and down. Uh, however, uh, being a young individual coming in, you know, you go through uh, your, your, your high school and you try to decide what path you're going to be on. What path will you take? Like most of the other kids out there, uh, I was a long haul truck driver. I worked uh, in the uh, industry of uh, construction uh, and restaurant. I was trying to find my way. I wasn't sure. I knew that I would be a soldier at some point in time because of where I lived and what I experienced. But it was uh, serendipitous that it happened in, in, in the way it did. Um, I think that for our youth to, uh, in, in Hopkinton or around America to understand is that you need a goal some sort of goal. It doesn't have to be five-year, 10-year, 15-year goal. You need some sort of goal to, uh, to look forward to and to, to reach out. Uh, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. For me, um, I thought that the, the military was always a viable solution. Uh, coming to terms with the uh, new country I was uh, understanding, uh, I thought that, well, how do I want to do it? Uh, well, uh, it, it, would, it would serve me. Uh, I spent a, a couple years being a truck driver. Uh, I changed path. I started going to a uh, community college for uh, engineering sciences uh, to try to give myself more potential in the market. And I realized that I had the opportunity to uh, enlist in the Army without a college degree to eventually fly helicopters. And then I had the skill set, and then I had the ASVAB scores to get me there. So I went down the recruiter. Uh, I talked to them. I took my testing, uh, my interviews, and uh, the slots open for uh, uh, warrant office test flights are either you're uh, available while you're serving in the military, or there are slots available for the um, civilian uh, applicants. I happened to be a civilian applicant, so I had to go through the whole uh, uh, process of uh, weeding out, if you will. Uh, and they select a certain amount of candidates, and from there you go to your basic training, you go to your follow-on uh, school if there's a delay, and then eventually you end up at Fort Rucker, Alabama, which is the helicopters. Uh, uh, it's the premier school for helicopters. Well, uh, what? Uh, uh, made you interested in helicopters to, be, to begin with? Because this sounds like it started even before you sure. entered the service. Um, well, when, you, when, you're, when you're a kid, you always think about hovering. You always think about being a bird. You always think, wow, it would be very cool to sit upon the trees and just be in total control of your element and to move left to right and do whatever you wanted to do. Uh, that type of freedom, I think all, all children uh, male or female, it, it really doesn't matter today, has a desire to have that fri type of freedom. And, uh, you know, jets are supposedly cool and they're sleek, supposedly, uh, very biased, uh, but helicopters uh, are, are close to the ground and they serve a different purpose. And uh, they also are uh, the ground pounder, uh, our, our soldiers on the ground 
our link uh, to them and, and them to us, either to insert, exfil, get them in, out, resupply, take care of their wounded. Uh, often we are their lifeline. Uh, so that's another way of, uh, of serving. Mm -hmm. But flying has always been uh, mystical from my childhood. Yeah. And, uh, and how was that experience at Rucker? I imagine that's a, a pretty intense uh, training program. Well, uh, Dick, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, anything worthwhile is not easy. Anything that you have to uh, go through, struggle through, uh, either builds character uh, and gives you insight uh, to other strengths that you don't know. The funny thing about it is while you're undergoing these type of uh, endeavors, you haven't a clue this is what, this is, this toolbox is what you're building. Uh, you, you hear the echo of your parents, do this for this, do that for that, but you don't understand it until you get much older and realize that your parents were quite brilliant, more, more cases. Uh, uh, that, uh, um, Fort Rucker was a, a type of, uh, of course, you all have your hell week. Uh, sometimes your weeding out period is to ensure that you have uh, unknowns that could fit into the uh, proper mold mm -hmm. to be molded. Uh, at the time I went through, it was a 42-week long course, um, and that did not entail the follow-on training or the, the weeding out process. However, the, um, the weeding out process was pretty, uh, pretty funny when you look back at it. Some people would think, oh, that's uh, so collegiate or so uh, fraternity-like. No, unfortunately, when the nation gives you this uh, responsibility of being in the coat of arms, what they're saying to you is that we will train you, we trust you, you have to be above reproach, you have a higher calling, you have a responsibility to your citizens, to your leadership, to your uh, uh, civilian uh, uh, politicians, to everything. You have to be better, you have to have a higher standard. What I mean by that is that you have to, you're going to get the training uh, to go into harm's way, to be successful, to uh, put down uh, uh, dictators that are doing unspeakable things to others. But you have to be trusted. So you're a part of America. You, you have to be trusted because, quite frankly, uh, who says you can't uh, reverse that talent if you're disgruntled? So the weeding out process is very important. You have to understand that the coat of arms is, is to me, it's like being a, a fireman or a police officer. Same thing. Hmm. I, I match them all equally. When I'm away, I expect those professionals to take care of my home front. And when I'm home, I, I, I still rely on them. So I, I, I match them together. So. It was comical. There, you know, everything had a position. Your drawers had to be uh, dressed right, dress. Your underwear folded. Uh, your 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 shirts rolled up. Your socks, and they had to be uh, positioned. Uh, and you know, dropping a quarter. Oh yeah, it was all there. Uh, there were days we'd come back from uh, training, and our whole bay would be in a big pile in the center. Everything, every bed was taken apart. Things thrown up. However, because we weren't meeting the standard. The standard was given to us, it was explained to us, it was demonstrated. Uh, some individuals either could comply, some did better, but we were not gelling together as a team. And therefore, they made it uh, quite painful <laughs> to uh, say, listen, you're going to be entrusted as a warrant officer of the United States Army, you're going to have men, you are going to be responsible. You better have your attention to detail, and you better be paying attention, and you better take care of your brothers and sisters. End of story. So that happened once or twice, and, and we eventually got out of that mode because we uh, then regrouped inside the barracks, and okay, we were uh, shifting around, talking, okay, okay, how's your stuff look, rechecking each other. Eventually, um, it got better. But they'd wake up in the morning. Uh, sometimes it was easier than others, the, the method in which they wake you up. Uh, you go out, do your PT. Uh, you come back in. Uh, you'd have uh, maybe a minute and a half or two minutes for the whole bay to clean up in uniform, out, march to chow. 
Now, eating. Eating's funny. You think that uh, square meals were only in the, uh, in, the, in the movies? No, every meal was wipe, you chew, you drink, wipe, swallow, and they would have the tax walking around watching. And, and a lot of people think, oh, isn't that hard? Oh, that, that's just mean. Or, However, it wasn't. It was serving a point. These are the procedures that you need to live in. These are hard times. They're stressing you out. Can you still follow direction? Can you still bring about uh, the knowledge you've learned? Can you still bring it up out of your cortex and say, hey, I know where I am. I, I know I haven't slept. Uh, it's been rough. I'm doing what I'm told, trained, understood. It's not saying I'm a robot because you still have free will to either do it or not. Mm -hmm. And some of the funny things at Chow were someone doing that, laughing, because you're, you're supposed to look at the other person in front of you, and you start laughing at each other, and hmm. well, you get demerits, and you'd have to walk your uh, DTs. Your, uh, at the end of the day, if you had certain demerits, you had to walk for 15 minutes in uniform, and then you go back and do your studying, which was uh, pretty intensive. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure I, I kind of lost track of the question, why did I get into the helicopters? It was a myriad of things. Um, but the bottom line, I believe, is to serve. Yeah. Uh, often, uh, when I came over from America, I, I knew uh, as a young child that we had uh, our Vietnam vets, our, our, the sacrifices. Those individuals that had half the training made um, stellar. Today, we probably have PhD-type level training versus what those individuals received. And uh, the way they still represented ourselves in that type of environment, uh, unbeknownst, uh, I, don't, I haven't seen it in modern warfare. If you look around uh, uh, today, the many different conflicts, you're going to realize that many opportunity uh, uh, will arise to, to have the human spirit uh, get angry. Mm -hmm. But our, our, our sons and daughters have displayed uh, intense moral fiber, ethical uh, type of control. Unbelievable. Mm. Uh, so our lineage, uh, I'm very thankful that I had those type of examples to, uh, to grow from. I'm very excited that uh, the fact that if they did not participate, the country we know may be very different. Uh, this is entirely my view. But we have to understand that they, they served with honor. They served well uh, with the training and the information they had and the leadership they had. Um, and, and they allowed the, the torch to be transferred. We were able to take that, rebuild uh, from lessons learned, to uh, grow into an army, uh, a, a Navy, a Marine Corps, an Air Force, unmatched, unmatched by the world. Uh, and we have ethics, and we have morals, and we have uh, laws of warfare, which we abide by, which we, which our young uh, soldiers, uh, given the hardships that they face today, have abided by and have uh, shown great restraint in, in, in the, the, the daily uh, issues that they face. Mm. Um, that's, that's a type of element yeah. I want to be a part of. Yeah. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a citizen soldier. I, I'm in the Air Force. I bleed green. I love it. Uh, well, you were in the army then, and you were yes, bleeding sir. green. Yes, <laughs> I still kind of like uh, blue green. What what does blue green mean? <laughs> I'm not is sure. that purple? I think it's purple. Yeah. The uh, uh, once you completed your helicopter training and subsequent assignments, at some point you decided to move on to uh, get a uh, commission. Maybe yes. you can explain that because okay. uh, you wound up at uh, Fort Follow Me at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, yes, place sir. near and dear to my heart, where I. Went to ranger school and and uh, chased a few snakes to eat and things like that. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little behind that decision. Dick, uh, thank you very much uh, for that lead-in. Uh, yes. When I was a warrant officer, and, and a warrant officer is still the best rank in the military, um, after a while you are commissioned because you have the authority of UCMJ to um, administer uh, uh, 
discipline, uh, but also you are in a position of responsibility where you are also responsible for what is good or bad, which is great. Around my seventh year, I realized that uh, there are a bunch of young lieutenants coming in, and, and they were uh, not only were they the pay was better, <laughs> but their opportunities seemed to be um, better. And, and it was, well, this is great. This is fun. If I just want to stay in it for the thrill of life and, and uh, be consistently engage in, in only helicopter operations and never get a, a purview of what else our vast uh, military has to offer and, and, and the growth that can happen, I decided, well, I have to finish my degree. Um, so I did it at night. Uh, at back then, the Army uh, gave us, uh, as warrant officers, 75% tuition assist uh, assistance, which was perfect. Um, and when you ended... Uh, I guess when you started, it was a year after, it was proactive. While you're doing the uh, uh, training, your time counted, but you owed a year for every credit or class you took. Uh, today, I, I believe uh, DOD-wide, uh, while you're enlisted to the, uh, the, the military, you can still do the college fund, but while you're enlisted, they pay 100%. If you, if you would like to get your college degree, they have the opportunity for you. It is given to you. They want their citizen soldiers to be um, smarter, uh, more knowledgeable, more aware, uh, and the opportunities exist. It is another way of paying for college, uh, and if you choose to make it a career or don't, if you get out, you still have your college degree to get your master's or your PhD. You have avenues that you've earned, and, and the system hopefully will uh, be geared for when you do finally leave to fit the situation of the economy at that time. Um, for myself, I, I knew that I was going to be a soldier, uh, a coat of arms uh, uh, wearer for the rest of my life. Uh, and that's my life decision I've made. So to keep that dream alive, I finished my college degree. I went to OCS down at Fort Benning, uh, school for wayward boys, 90-day uh, wonders. Uh, you hear a lot of different things. Uh, in my particular class in 1993, we started, I think, with 168 uh, students. And I think we graduated 65. Um, those were uh, very, very long, long days. Uh, I think the first week we were there, we probably averaged 45 minutes of sleep. Uh, because when you are an officer, as you well know, Dick, uh, you are responsible for the men and women, equipment, and the mission under your purview. It lies upon you. And, and they have to try to train you and weed you out to make sure that you are going to be that individual that will uh, not only be responsible for that cradle of, uh, of, resp uh, of, of life and equipment, but also the image of the uh, United States, the Department of Defense, and the military in general. You now go a step higher. You have, like I said earlier, a, a wider purview. Now you're entering into that. What does it mean to be an officer in the military? Well, a responsibility. You don't get to be a 19-year-old kid and make those mistakes. You have to think th once, twice, three times, four times maybe to make a decision or not. You have to have that personal strength to do that. And OCS really uh, burned it into you. That's what you're there for. Uh, if you didn't have the uh, internal strength to uh, make it through, listen to direction, when you had very little sleep, uh, you know, you got to understand, there's no school that allow you to, they, they can't shoot at you, they can't stress you out to a point and see how you're going to react. All they can do is, is put you through um, situations and see how you react. And, they, and they, you had classes, you had training. It was ongoing uh, cyclic type of uh, situation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in officer candidate school, you have your basic officer candidate, you have your intermediate officer candidate, and you have your senior officer candidate. We had a, uh, uh, a uh, senior TAC officer change, so we never made it out of uh, basic officer candidate. We were a box for a long time. Huh. Uh, the new guy had to reevaluate and make sure that we were cutting the mustard <laughs> to his standards. Uh, so our hell week was 
quite some time longer. Yeah. But it was interesting. Um, uh, the people that made it through uh, deserved. Uh, uh, those that um, did not have the staying power, they made a personal choice to say, well, this isn't for me. It wasn't like, you know, they're being picked on where, you know, oh, you're, you're singling them out. No. There was across the board stress for everybody, and it's up to you, the individual, because in a time of uh, national crisis, you, the officer, in a position of leadership, has to respond, has to react. And hopefully you're going to make the right decisions. Hopefully you're going to be accountable. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm sure that you made a lot of excellent decisions. And uh, unfortunately, leaving the Army, my, uh, my alma mater yes, was, was a tough one. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be able to come back and join us uh, and, and go into your uh, service as, a, as an Air Force officer uh, at another time. We, uh, we certainly appreciate uh, you coming in today, and uh, we've gotten you for the f first half of your career, which is with the U.S. Army, and uh, we really would like to have you back real soon and talk with the folks here on Veterans Remember uh, about your, your time in the Air Force and maybe a little bit more in detail with some of the things that you've been involved in with your service. Can we count on you coming back? Uh, sir, if you allow me to talk about some of my Army exploits in that venue, I'd be more than happy to <laughs> share with you. You found the channel and you've watched the shows. Now, find out how the magic happens on Inside H Camp.